Hello, hello, hello. Welcome to another amazing knowledge bomb of Lead to Greatness, where we believe in helping others reach their greatest potential, and together we can change the world. Today on Lead to Greatness, we have Greg Bottenhorn. Don't forget to subscribe, like, and share this podcast. Greg is the Chief Marketing Officer of Jazby a family finance app. Greg's expertise is in strategic management of the workforce, recruiting, building sales teams, strategic planning, branding, and revenue growth. On today's podcast, Greg is dropping knowledge bomb after knowledge bomb after knowledge bomb. Talks about tips on educating our children about money, to team building, to employment development, and also marketing and sales. Please help me welcome Greg with Level Up Leadership. This is Cedric Francis, and you're listening to Lead to Greatness. I had a friend who worked for this big upcoming brand in, in Massachusetts, and she used to come home every night from work talking about how much she loved her job. And so I said, hey, listen, you know, I'm, I'm looking for something new. I'm looking for a new challenge. You know, maybe you can get me in there. The problem was is that I was in marketing and because it was a young, exploding brand in a market where marketing is so big, there was no way I was going to get into their marketing department. I was young. I was inexperienced. And so the way I looked at it is if I could get into another department, I have an easier time of moving into their marketing mm. team, right? So I went there and interviewed for a very entry level sales job. And I was on the first interview and I I start going through it. Uh, The interviewer asked me, he's like, I'm looking at your resume and your background. And it seems like you're more of a marketing guy. You know, tell me why you're here for this this particular job. And so I told him the same story I just told you. I was very honest. And um, and he said, hey, listen, I I appreciate your honesty, but I have one question for you. He said, I've been talking to you for five minutes. I think you can sell. And I want to know why you want to be in marketing when it's a marketer's job to make a salesperson rich. Um, And that line just always stuck with me. And uh, I am a very money motivated person. And so that was kind of the beginning of my sales career. I ended up doing every role in sales that that company offered. I I broke barriers, age barriers, everything. And and it was just a phenomenal experience. So that's kind of where I came from. That's pretty amazing. How did you... I guess merging the sales and the marketing together and working sure. that for your benefit. So it's funny, a lot of people really don't understand what the differences are between the two, but marketing is generally more of the data and the creative side of it. Basically, mm-hmm. they prepare the salespeople um, with the tools and the knowledge that they need to go out and be successful. Mm-hmm. Sales is the actual act of going out, talking to customers and explaining why your product is the best option for them, right? Some businesses do merge them together. I'm actually a pretty big fan of keeping them separate. I think those two groups should work very closely together, but they have very different roles in the, the, the sales cycle. The other part of that is that, you know, some of it depends on if you're talking B2B or B2C, right? So in a, in a B2B community, sales is really the driver. In B2C, it's really marketing. And so marketing in B2C and sales in B2B are actually very similar. It's just the audience that you're selling to is different. So I think that's one of the big things. I've always been interested in both, um, but the sales side is where the money's at. And like I said, I've, I've always been money motivated. Um, and quite honestly, I was just naturally good at it. And so I was successful at it without kind of going down the same uh, normal paths that a lot of sales people go down. Wow. That's awesome. I-, I want you to speak to the Lead to Greatness community. The Lead to Greatness community has uh, entrepreneurs, a lot of business startup. What are some of the big mistakes you've seen small startup companies make in the very beginning of launching? I would say the number one thing is hiring and it's it's the wrong hiring decisions. It's um, too many hires. So I'm a, I'm a firm believer that as you're growing a startup company, don't try to grow too quickly. Um, even if you have the the ability and the money to do so, I think there's something to be said for having a lean, driven, motivated workforce. Mm-hmm. I would also say, I think one of the biggest mistakes that entrepreneurs make is they try to hold on to too much of their equity. 
I think as you're hiring people, no matter if they have a ton of experience or even no experience, I think they should have equity in that company, um, mainly because people work differently when there's an ownership stake there, right? Even if it's a very small amount, um, as long as you are leading them correctly, they'll understand how what they're doing impacts themselves and their, their personal value. Um, and I think that's super important. The other thing is, honestly, oftentimes it's, it's the entrepreneur, the business owner that has the vision and they know exactly what they want to do. You know, just chances are if they've done it before, they've been successful at it in the past and they're very resistant to outside ideas. The best thing that you can do is be totally open to them. Um, and again, I know that that sounds easy, but it's really not. I mean, think of yourself, you've started a company, you, you have the vision in mind, it's your baby and you're in a room and someone's telling you your baby's ugly. You have to be okay with that. Right. Mm -hmm. So I open up a lot of meetings with, with agencies and things like that. And I tell them, Hey, listen, tell me my baby's ugly. I I'm okay with it. I get it. We're not going to get anywhere. If you sit here and tell me how great my idea is and how everything's fantastic, like nothing's going to improve that way. Where we improve is where you come in and you tell me where I could be doing better. Let me tell you, Cedric, because I think this is really relevant. So when I, when I came to JASB, I had an employee and we had hired her on as a social media person, basically. She was fresh out of college. Her background in college was in art. She was an art major um, and she was there and she was doing social media. I had been in, in startup companies and large organizations and in high level roles for 20 plus years. Mm -hmm. And I sat my team in a room and I wanted to hear what they had done before. And I wanted to tell them about some of the things I wanted to do differently. And here's this young girl and she, she you know, very professionally and correctly said, hey, listen, I, I think what you're saying there makes sense, but here's why I don't think it's the right move. And most importantly, what I think we should do instead. Mm. And I, I loved that. I ended up promoting her three times over the, the next couple of years. She ended up being my right-hand person. Um, she was phenomenal. And it all started with that. She professionally challenged me. I was okay with it and accepted it and admitted that she had a better idea than I had, yeah. right? And that's okay. And too many people let their ego mm. get in the way there and say, ah, listen, I know what I'm doing right? And sometimes someone else has a better idea and that's good. Man, that, that is a knowledge bomb. That's a knowledge bomb because I, I believe a lot of times as entrepreneurs, that's, that is a big mistake we make because we have this vision and we think we have the best idea when somebody comes. Matter of fact, we don't even give people the opportunity, you know, to give us that feedback. We say we want it, but we really don't. And they see it in our actions. And so I think that's really a great thing. And even for CEOs, for entrepreneurs, for leaders to understand that feedback is very important. A lot of times we have this great idea, but what do you think the danger in utilizing your idea, whatever you came up with, your baby, whatever you want to call it? And the truth of the matter is the baby may be ugly. The customer don't want the baby, but we spend thousands and hundreds of thousands of dollars on this ugly baby that no one wants. And we're wondering why our business does not go forward. Speak to that. Absolutely. So I think that's a huge one, right? And I, I think part of it is, and I can even tell you from a Jazby perspective, where we were when we started and where we are today are very different. Mm -hmm. We're doing some things that we set out saying, we don't want to do this. Right. And then as we grew, we listened to the market, we saw what the market was doing, and we, we, we tried to think of it differently mm -hmm. and say, hey, listen, okay, I know we've never wanted to do that, but there's a reason why it's going on in the market. Why is that? And what kind of twist can we put on it to make it ours, right? Mm -hmm. And so I think that's part of recognizing that the baby might be ugly yeah. and understanding how to, how to put lipstick on it, right? Mm -hmm. So wow. I think there's a little bit of, of a difference there. Oh, man. Um, the other thing, you know, it's funny. I, I, so I talked with a, I talk with a lot of young entrepreneurs, people where it's their first idea. Mm -hmm. And one of the things they always say, and they say it like a positive, and they say, there's nobody else out there doing this. <laughs> and I always say, I'm like, look, it, it, competition is good right? If nobody's doing it in the market, generally there's a reason why, yeah. right? Uh, so you don't always have to look for those things that nobody else is doing. Look for things that people are doing already that there's a market for and find a way to do it better or do it differently or, or innovate it so that it's for today instead of yesterday. Greg, you're kicking out with some knowledge bomb. That's another knowledge bomb. That is so awesome. And, and speaking of that, we're talking about feedback. Because I believe getting that feedback, that is a leadership issue and leaders need to understand it. What uh, characters, values, and qualities that you believe every great leader should have and why? 
so Cedric, one of the words you keep using that I love is leader, right? And I think oftentimes the words leadership and management get used the same and they're so different, right? The idea is as a leader, you, you really have to get out and show people the way and be open to different things, develop people. A manager is very good at telling you what to do throughout the day and managing spreadsheets and asking for data. A leader goes out and tells you why that's important, right? Mm -hmm. So I think from a, a characteristic standpoint, mm -hmm. one of the biggest things that I do, one of the very first interview questions that I ask people is what motivates you? And I think as a leader, it's super important to understand that what motivates your people is what's going to determine if they end up being good employees or bad employees. Wow. You have to lead people based on how they're motivated, not on how you're motivated, right? Mm. Um, if you can speak to somebody in terms of what motivates them, and what their personal value is in the overall business value, they're gonna be far more productive. Mm -hmm. So I think that that's huge. Yeah. Um, in terms of developing people, so outside of understanding the motivations, you know, keep their goals in mind, right? So one of the other things that I do very early on is I sit down with people and I ask them what they wanna be doing five, 10 years from now. And usually you kind of get a blank stare. Every now and then someone knows the answer to it. But helping those people understand, okay, if I want to go from here to here, what are those 10 steps that are between now and then, right? Because oftentimes people don't keep that in mind. Mm -hmm. And then you start working with them to help develop them for the next step in the ladder, right? So I involve people in things that they might not normally be involved in, in, in other businesses, because that's part of their development. And as their leader, that's part of my job. The other key component is of this, and entrepreneurs really struggle with this, Cedric. I'm not going to lie to you. I'm a big fan of development. Develop your people for their future, not yours, right? So get them ready for whatever it is they're going to do in life, yes. and be okay with the fact that that might lead them away from your organization, uh -huh. right? I, I can't tell you how many current employees I've given strong references for when they wanted to leave, and they were great employees. But I understood. I told them on day one that I was gonna develop them and prepare them for their future. Yeah. I can't say that and at the end go back and say, you know, you, you can't leave, I've put too much time into you. It totally defeats it. I lose credibility in that instance. Oh. And what happens is eight times out of 10 maybe, they end up coming back and working with me in some other way in the future. Once they've learned something else, which is also great, because now they're coming back to me and back to my organization and they're bringing something different. That, that I hadn't taught them, that I couldn't have taught them necessarily. I think that's huge. And again, this, this part sounds easy, but it's really awesome. not. And I would say, don't, don't ever stop innovating, right? And as a startup, it's, it's, that part's easy because you have to constantly be innovating. Mm -hmm. The problem is, is that there's always these plateaus in business where you get there, the market's receptive to your product. Everything's going great. The growth starts happening, money's coming in, you're hiring employees. And we just feel like we've arrived and we start doing, which is one of the things that I hate in business. And it's the idea of protect the core, right? Mm -hmm. We need to make sure that these people are coming in, they stay with us, they need us, they have to keep coming back. And it does two things. One, it, it makes your customers angry because you come off as arrogant, right? And they start waiting for somebody else to do it better than you so that they can leave you. Um, and the other thing it does is it allows competition to pass you. And now you're starting from a standstill. So the innovation has to keep going. As a matter of fact, I'll tell you when things are going good, that's when you innovate harder. That's mm -hmm. when you pull all your leaders in your room and say, hey, things are great. We're, we're doing well. What's next? What's two steps down the road from here? Where are we going? Right. And is what we're doing now to make us successful, even what we need to be doing in order to get to the next level. Nothing is ever beneath you. Right. And so, you know, one of, one of the lines that, that my people always hear me say is if the phone's ringing and someone answer it, I don't, I don't care what your, what the, the title after your name is. I don't care what level you're at. The phone's ringing and no one's answering to pick up the phone. Right. Um, so I'm, I'm a big believer that nothing's ever beneath me. Now that doesn't mean you don't delegate and you don't have people that free you up to do other things you do, but every now and then think, especially as an entrepreneur, things will pull your attention away that, is absolutely worth the time you take to do that, right? So I, one of my lines is always, is, is always understand and don't fear the worst case scenario, right? So it goes with taking risks, mm. um, but I always say, I wanna understand and practice the worst case scenario because once I get okay with the worst case scenario, nothing bad can happen to me. 
And if I'm at a point where I look at it and say, you know what, I'm not okay with that worst case scenario, then that risk isn't worth taking, right? So that's how I determine if it's a risk that's worth taking or not. I think that's huge. <laughs> knowledge bombs after knowledge bombs after knowledge bombs after knowledge bombs. Greg, this is awesome. Man, this is awesome. I know Lead to Greatness community is gonna be better for this. The, the knowledge bombs you're dropping on us, man, I, I, I'm listening right now. I'm like, man, this is why you guys are successful. This is why the, the success of Jasmine. Actually, uh, last night, I, you know, as I was preparing for the interview, my wife and I, we looking at the, man, you, you guys' product. I was like, man, this is awesome. You know, teaching our kids before they leave the home. That was a big issue for me. When I left the house, I made money. Actually, I joined the military, made money but I really didn't know what to do with it. I didn't understand money and I failed for the next six years before I began to get it together. And one of the things I was thinking about as raising the children, I was like, man, this is really great. You know, teaching them about finance before they leave the home, how important it is and what to do with this money. And man, I, what you guys are doing is really great. So what I want you to do right now, I want, I want you to talk about JASB and what inspired you to begin this journey and why. Sure. So, you know, it's, it's let, let me tell you the kind of the commercial meaning first, and then I'll kind of get deeper with it. So ultimately, you know, we're here, we're how families share money. That's what I always tell people. Awesome. We're almost like a Venmo for families type thing, right? But we're, we're, we're how families share money. And so really it's a way for parents and grandparents to reward kids for all the normal things, chores, activities, allowances, uh, good grades, sports, holidays, birthdays, um, but reward them in a way that they can actually use, right? So we've allowed, as a society, we it's one of the few weird areas we haven't kept up with things that have changed and it's, it's currency, right? So we're still giving our kids cash and checks and that hasn't kept up with how they spend money. So 70% of the money kids spend is done electronically. It's done online or in app, right? Yet we're still giving them cash and checks as rewards. And so really what's happened is kids are starting to reject that a little bit. Um, you know, I don't know about you, but in my house, you know, my, when my kids get the, the $5 check from grandma at the, around the holidays, it goes on the fridge under a magnet. And then six months later, they call me up and they say, hey, that check was never cashed. Yeah. It's still in my on my fridge under a magnet, right? Um, and all the cash that we give kids, it ends up wadded up in some drawer somewhere. Cedric, I can't even tell you, I have four kids. I can't even tell you how many times I've walked into one of my kids' rooms and I've seen money just lying on the floor with like dirty laundry because that's how they view it. It's, it's, it's a piece of paper. And so we haven't kept up with that. So enter Jasby, and Jasby is a way for those parents and grandparents to send the money electronically and then take it a step further, allow the kid to spend that same money electronically. Um, so they can spend it in what we call the Jazzy shop, right? Which essentially has all the things that kids want to buy anyway, electronics, apparel, gift cards, you know, you name it, it's in there. Um, and then we also have the Jazby virtual debit card, which allows kids to spend that money anywhere else where MasterCard or Apple Pay are accepted. So if after school they want to go and get a slice of pizza with their friends, they can do that. If they want to buy something online, they can do that. Um, let me tell you why that's important. So as a parent, you know, my kids, and again, every time I tell the story, other parents are like, uh-huh. So as a parent, let's say we've given the kid, you know, cash over the last year, and now they want to buy a video game that they're buying online. Kid comes over to you, they've got two handfuls of wadded up bills, and they put them in front of you, and they say, I want to buy that video game for $60. Mm -hmm. I've got $47 here. So I owe you 13 and I need your credit card to buy that. Yeah. And as a parent, you're like, you know, it's kind of this awkward moment because you're taking money back from your kids and it's all wadded up. And you're like, what am I going to do with this? And do I really want to give my kid the credit card? But that's how kids buy stuff. So what are you going to do? They've earned the money, right? And so you hand over your credit card and you're always reluctant about it. Mm -hmm. And they go and they put it on the PlayStation or the Xbox and they buy their game. And uh, they'll say, hey, you know, thanks, dad. All, all's good. I owe you that $13. I'll work it off, whatever. And then three months later, I'm looking at my credit card statement and there's some recurring charge on there. Yeah. So I call my son over and I'm like, hey, uh, listen, this thing you signed up for online, did, did you know there was a $19.99 monthly charge? No, I didn't see that. Yeah. And it's, it's, it's just a bad experience, yeah. right? Um, so now, now my kids have their own uh, debit cards that they can plug in and use for that stuff. They're using their own money. 
I'll, I'll tell you what it's also done, Cedric, and it's it's been really great. My kids are so much more proactive now. I can't tell you, how, like my kids actually come to me now and ask how they can get money on Jazby. So, hey, can I mow the lawn today? And if I do, will you give me $10 on Jazby? Like my daughters are going to the mall with their friends and they say, hey, dad, you know, if I clean the house, can you send some money on Jazby for me so I can buy some stuff? You know, I'll call, one of my daughters drives and I'll call her up and say, hey, yeah, uh, we pick up some some bread on the way home. I'll send you money in Jazby. It's, it's been great. So that's kind of the commercial aspect. The other real reason for Jazby, and it's, it's no less important, but whenever I say this part first, it, it, it sounds flat because there is a what's in it for us, right? I want to be very clear about that. Uh, but financial literacy for kids in this country is brutal. Um, we're not teaching it in schools generally anymore. We're certainly not talking about it at home. In fact, money in home has almost become a taboo subject, right? Mm -hmm. Take a little detour there. One of the things that I think helps us learn about money as kids back when I was growing up was you'd see mom or dad balancing the checkbook. Um, they, you'd see them clipping coupons to use at the store. Mm -hmm. You'd see them budgeting. Even further back, you'd see the envelopes they'd have in the cabinet in the kitchen, Absolutely. where when they got paid, they'd actually go to a bank, cash mm -hmm. their paycheck, and then put money in the electric envelope in wow. the cabinet, right? We'd, we'd see all that stuff. And that would automatically lead to us asking questions as curious kids. So, hey, what are you doing with your checkbook? You're looking back through all these old checks. Tell me about that. Hey, I see you're clipping coupons. Why? Hey, I know you went to the bank on every Friday to cash your paycheck. Tell me about it, right? We don't see that anymore. What we see is our, our parents on the computer doing everything electronically. And so they could be working, they could be reading a book, they could be paying bills, we don't know. And so it doesn't lead to those same questions in those same natural conversations. And it's, it's a major issue. And so what it's resulted in, in this country, we're tied, it it's fluctuates, but we're around 20th in the world tied with Botswana in terms of uh, world financial literacy rates, right? Mm -hmm. You know, we, we have kids that are going to, and I've talked to these professors that teach economics at Harvard, and you have economics majors entering Harvard that don't understand the basics of interest rates. Nice. Now, these are, these are the kids that are going to be our future government leaders, our future business leaders. Yes. They're going to be creating these budgets. And yeah, I'm sure they'll learn a good deal at Harvard, but how much better would they be if they went in with the basic knowledge, Right. It's a major issue that we're facing. People know it, but it's really hard to fix. So enter Jazby and honestly enter the, you know, there's four or five players in our space and we all say the same thing, right? We're here, we're going to help kids with financial literacy. And this is, uh, this is an exclusive secret just for you, Cedric, right? Mm -hmm. None of us are actually doing anything about it, right? We are teaching kids how to spend money. Yeah. which is important, don't get me wrong, but we're really not teaching them about financial literacy. Yeah. I would tell you that that's changed in a dramatic way at JASB. We are doing several things to make sure that we are walking the walk and not just saying we're going to help kids with this, but we're actually rolling out tools and ways to help kids with this. Yeah. So think of things like uh, financial literacy scores for kids and actual tools that help them see how they're progressing and see how they're developing and getting better in this. Tips for mom and dad in terms of how you can help your kids. Look, Amazing. we all know as parents, kids learn by doing. They don't learn by someone sitting there lecturing about it. They learn by doing. How can you as a parent help your kid so that when they go out into the world, they're, they have, they're a more financially literate young adult, which will make them a more financially responsible adult and parent in the future. So I talk to parents all the time that when I talk about allowances, they say, my kid lives in my house. It's their responsibility to contribute to that house. And I'm the one that buys them stuff. So I'm not giving them an allowance on top of that. And I'll tell you, and I'm telling you, that's the wrong approach to take. By giving a kid an allowance, it helps them start to understand the whole earning aspect, the whole managing money aspect, the whole need versus want aspect. Real quick story. I, I always call it the cleat story. And Benny said not to steal any of his stories, but I'm, I'm going to steal this one. <laughs> yeah. So Be Benny has two boys. They play football. And every year he'd bring them to the store. They would need football cleats. And he'd say, hey, boys, go pick out the cleats that you want. They'd pick them out. They'd go up front. Dad would swipe the credit card. Everybody go home happy. The kids would choose them based on the brand or the color, some combination of those two. And on average, they were spending about $100 each on mm -hmm. cleats. So when, when Jazby first started, Benny said, hey, listen, I'll tell you what, I'm going to give you guys each $100 on Jazby. 
I want you to go buy your own cleats and whatever money you have left is yours. You can keep wow. and do whatever you want with it. That's These kids gosh. turned into educated consumers overnight, oh, right? Geez. They start, I mean, forget color and brand. Like they were looking at, okay, these are still cool, yet they're less expensive. Hey, what's on sale? What's not? This is last year's model, but we can get a deal on it, right? And like they ended up spending $70 each. I think one was 65 and one was 70. Right. They pooled the remaining money and they bought a video game. But think of the lesson that those kids learned just through that small one experience. And thank you for sharing that. That, that is so amazing. I, how did you guys discover this issue? And then how did you turn it into a business? Yeah, so Benny, my, 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 our, my partner, my CEO, um, he is a payments industry legend. If, if he was here, he'd be blushing right now. He hates it when I say that, but it's the truth, <laughs> right? So um, Jazby's his third company. He's been very successful. He's very driven. He just, I, I've worked for a lot of CEOs, both big companies and startups, and he's, I would say, the, the one that just gets it the most. It's why I kind of came out of retirement to work with him, right? So he, um, through the payments industry, he just saw this gap. And again, I think he saw the issue with his kids in terms of how they were getting money, how they were spending nice. money, some of the issues that it created. Yeah. And he just said, hey, if I can put a payments platform behind this, and I know all the security and all the framework that needs to be done here, I can turn this into something that would be really big for families. Yeah. Um, the other part is he always, you know, he's always done B2B companies in the past. And he's always really wanted to be in the B2C community. Um, and so this was a way for him to kind of get in there. Um, it's a, there's a need in the market. There's other people doing it, but it's a small, growing, fast industry. And he's very good at spotting those things. And so what he then did is he went out and said, okay, I need to find all these people in areas that are different than me that have all been there and done that. So everybody in our leadership team has been through the startup growth. We've all had successful exits from companies. We've all grown with companies from startup to, to large. Um, and so we know kind of all those things that happen along the way and, and we get it, uh, but that's really how it all started and where it came from. Um, you said something that I thought was awesome. Actually, I wrote it down because I think this, this can be missed during this interview. You mentioned, I'm going to reword it, but diversified leadership team yeah. is a big key factor when starting a business, especially a business in this industry that a lot of people is not doing. I think, man, that's, and you guys are brilliant. You're right, oh, you guys are brilliant. Appreciate it, Thank you. Let me, let me ask you this question. I do want to deal with this because we're, you know, some say we're still in the pandemic. Some say we're coming out of pandemic. How has COVID-19 positively or negatively influenced your organization? And what adjustments have you made or is currently making? Sure. So a couple of things there. One, I, I mentioned earlier, um, I think that one of the mistakes that startups make is they grow too fast. They mm -hmm. hire too many people. They get big, bigger space. They do all this. Uh -huh. um, you know, again, I'm not going to sit here and tell you everybody with Jazby is perfect. You know, we were having these conversations about, hey, wh who, who can we hire? Where do we need to go? Do we need bigger space? All of these conversations. Uh -huh. I, I actually think, I want to word this very carefully because it's obviously COVID has been terrible, but I think for us as a business, in some ways it was a blessing in disguise mm -hmm. because it forced us to stay lean and to stay focused mm -hmm. on the end goal. So we made sure, the first thing we did is we sat down and made sure we could survive it. So we're still a company that runs on, on what we call OPM for other people's money. Right. And that's something that I, as an entrepreneur, take very seriously, yeah. right? I invest in other companies and I hope there's somebody there that's taking my investment as seriously as I take others, right? And so what that means is if I'm gonna spend a dollar, I'm gonna make sure that it's a focused dollar, that I know where it's going, why it's going there and what's coming back in its place. Again, when growth starts happening, especially fast growth, it, it can kind of get away from you a little bit. Money's coming in the door. Everybody's happy. People, your customers are coming. You're, you're growing. I think that that's that lean startup mentality of people that are focused on the task at hand. That is really what gets you there. So COVID, to make a long story short, COVID slowed us down to an appropriate level where we said, okay, we need to make sure the money lasts. So what does that mean? Right. I would also tell you though, that 
I've always been a big believer in people need to be in the office, right? I think that so much good happens there. I think that you just feel the positive vibes, you see the growth, you get caught up in the energy of it and it makes you more productive, yeah. right? Yeah, there's some things that hurt productivity, water, water cooler talk and going to lunch with colleagues and all this. But I think you make up for all that through the energy and the buzz and the interaction that happens within an office. So I've been a big believer in that all along. People need to be in the office. What I learned and what we as a company learned, I think, through COVID was that that's changing quite a bit, right? And my views on it hadn't kept up, I don't think, with where things went. So I'll tell you this, our developers are far more productive from home than they ever were. They're far happier and they never want to go back to an office ever. And why are we going to make them? There's no benefit in it to us. They've found a way to interact with each other and to keep in touch with each other uh, via Zoom or, or other ways through our inner company messengers and things like that. So we're not really losing that piece of it. They're they're working better and they're working more uh, efficiently. So that's been a big shift in mindset for both Benny and I, because we've always both had the same mindset that people should be in the office. Uh -huh. so let me tell you about one of the big negatives that I think, right? Because uh -huh. again, I think too often in these, we talk about all the positive things and how everything's been great. Uh -huh. Let me give you a big negative. Uh -huh. I think that it's much harder now to um, onboard new hires mm. uh, into the atmosphere. And it's, it's, I think, much harder to develop people. Now there's ways to do it still, but I think it's, I think COVID and work from home has created more challenges around those things. I've seen a big difference in the employees that we've brought in during COVID than before. We, we have people with our company that have been around for a year now that haven't met their colleagues in person ever, right? And I, I think that they miss out on the culture and the overall um, you know, goals of the company and all that stuff, yeah. right? From, from a, a personal leadership, from the people that work directly for me, what I'll tell you is one of the things that I've always done, I mentioned this earlier, is I include people in things that they wouldn't normally be included in in other organizations. So what that might be is grabbing somebody for a meeting, you know, in the conference room that maybe they weren't invited to or wouldn't normally participate in. It's sitting down and doing a budget and saying, hey, why don't you watch me do this? And why don't we do it together? Because that's, as, we, as we've talked about in your growth plan, that's something you're going to need to know for the future. And we miss that now so often. And so we've got to find ways to, to still work those things in. What are some practical leadership growth tips that you can share with the Lead to Greatness community to help us reach our greatest potential? I think first and foremost is embrace change. And I think a lot of leaders and entrepreneurs will say that as kind of a throwaway line because they know that's what they're supposed to say. But the truth <laughs> is, as human beings, we're naturally resistant to change, right? It's, it's a scary thing. Um, I, I will tell you that the most successful startup companies, but even further, the employees within those companies are the ones that embrace change. So let me let me tell you again, I've been through this a few times from, from startup company to, to larger company. I've seen, including at Jazzy, by the way, really good employees that were great startup employees that as you started to grow, weren't the right employees for you moving forward because they couldn't embrace those change. Any company, as you go, you're going to have several major changes along the way. And sometimes it's even a total change in direction, everything. And I can tell you for myself as, as both, even from, as an entry level employee, those are things that I always embraced, right? Um, I always saw them as learning experiences. And I really took the opportunity to learn from the new people that were brought in or to learn a new skill or to take a new training or to do a different job within the organization, right? So embrace change is a big one. Um, learn from those around you. And I mean, all levels, mm. right? So you're not only learning from the people that the, the senior leaders within the organization, there's a lot we can learn from the entry level employees as well. One of the things I'll, I'll tell you that, that I've learned over the last several years is the technology piece of it, right? So a lot of the new hires that I'm bringing in, um, technology is, is na as natural to them as food and water, right? Yeah. That's all they've ever known. Yeah. I grew up in a time where we didn't have all of that. Yeah. So yeah, I've come along and I've learned a lot along the way, but these people that come in and that's all they know, 
I'm learning a lot from them. So I, I believe you need to learn from people of all levels. And by the way, that's good and bad stuff, right? So don't just take the good stuff, but take the bad. Mm. On that note, Cedric, I think this is a huge one. And it's this is more sales than marketing related, but it's about building a business. So one of the things we do um, is we'll, we, we, we close the big sale with a customer, right? And um, it's great. We move on and, and we, we all celebrate, right? When we lose a customer, we always ask the question of, oh man, why didn't, why did you choose the competitor? Why didn't you choose me? What happened? What did I, you know, we always ask that question. What we always forget to ask though, I shouldn't say always, but usually is when a big sales close, we never ask why they chose us. Wow. And that's just as important as when one didn't choose us. Yeah. Um, so as leaders, we need to know that. We need to understand why people are picking us, not just why they're not. And those answers are oftentimes very different, by the way. Yeah. I would also say, you know, I mentioned this earlier, but I'm going to bring it back because I think it's really important. We need to always ask about motivations yeah. you, I mean, and, and don't just assume that you know. Always ask people what motivates them. I'll tell you, I've gotten some really good answers to that question over the years. Um, and you, you can usually kind of figure out how that relates to different things that you're doing within your organization. Mm -hmm. um, so do the one-on-ones always. So for me, that's one of the things in my weekly schedule that I don't move around. And look, we're, as entrepreneurs and as leaders, we're all busy. We've got a million things going on. And so what happens is you're looking at the calendar in the day and you say, okay, what can I move around? I got to fit this in or that in. Um, and those one-on-ones with your employees are oftentimes one of the first things that are moved. They're bumped to another day. We say, hey, we'll just get together next week, whatever. Um, or more commonly, we say, you know what? I talk to those people all day long. Like, I, 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 don't, need to, I don't need to spend one-on-one -on -one time with them. I was with her yesterday. I was with him at lunch, whatever. What I would tell you is that usually when we're having those normal interactions with our employees, it's, it's our agenda, right? It's where we're going over something with them that's important. Wow. To me, one-on-one -on -one time, that's your time, right? So for my one-on-ones, I don't set the agenda. I don't ask for metrics or KPI information or any of it, right? I sit down and I say, okay, show me the agenda that you put together. Let's go over everything that you want to go over. And that's your hour to do that. You have to do those every week, no matter what. That's how your people feel connected. That's how they, they stay motivated. Um, that's how they'll go back and work harder for you. Never get too far away from the customer. So this is a mistake that I made early on in my career. Um, again, as an entrepreneur, as your company starts to grow, if you work for another company and you start to get promoted, right, um, you get further and further away from the end customer. Ultimately, for your business, that customer is all that matters, right? If, if they're happy and they're buying your product, you grow. If they're not, you don't, right? And what happens is as senior leaders, we, we sit in rooms and we make decisions about what we think is best and we have no idea, right? So I'm a big believer, never get too far from the customer. I always want to talk to customers. Every level that I'm at, I make time for it. I think it's important. I talk to the people that are talking to the customers. Hey, what are you hearing? What are people telling you? What do they like? What don't they like? We have to make time for that. It's really important. Oh, here's one other thing. And, you know, I, I didn't mention it earlier and it might not fit here, but I, I think it's really important, right? Mm -hmm. One of the things, so again, I started, I started in business at a young age. I, I moved up very quickly. Mm -hmm. um, no, I always believed in don't let the, the, there's, we all have limitations in our lives, right? Family backgrounds, educational backgrounds, whatever it happens to be. And we all let things hold us back and we, we set limitations for ourselves. I was always a believer that I'm just going to go for it. Right. I, I don't care what it is. I'm, I'm going to go for it. And how I got there was that I, I always believed that no matter what job you gave me, I was going to do it the best that you've ever seen it done. And so if you hired me, Cedric, to, to be the janitor and sweep your studio, I was going to be the best damn floor sweeper that you ever saw. Yeah. Right. And I think that that's super important to do at every level. You never get to a point where you're the best at it ever. And if you think that there's, there's issues. So even now as a, as a CMO, right, I wake up every morning wanting to be the best CMO that I can be. And so what can I do today that's going to make me stand out as the better one than anybody else? Yeah. Um, and I think we lose, we lose sight of that after those entry level jobs. I, I, I don't think we should. Great. Full of wisdom and knowledge, man. And I know that the Lead to Greatness community is going to be better 
forward. Anyone wanted to connect with you and what you're doing, where should they go? You can find me on LinkedIn. Um, just Greg Bottenhorn. I'm, I'm pretty much the only Greg Bottenhorn out there. It's what's great about that name. Uh, check us out on Jazby, jazby.com. We, we have an app both now in the iOS store and in the Google Play store. Again, if you send an, a message to our customer service department, generally I, I end up getting a lot of those as well from our service team. So you, you can reach me a variety of ways. I'm also on Facebook and Instagram and Twitter and all that stuff. But On behalf of the Lead to Greatness community, I want to thank you so much for taking time out of your busy schedule and adding value to us. Thank you, Cedric. I really appreciate you having me. This was a lot of fun. And don't forget to subscribe to Lead to Greatness if this is your first time. And if this podcast was helpful to you, leave a big thumbs up. And also, I want you to check out our Marriage Coach Podcast, the podcast with my wife and I. If you're on iTunes, please rate this podcast and leave a review and help get the word out. Again, thank you, Lead to Greatness Nation, for joining us on today. Looking forward to seeing you again on next week. Till then, remember, if you help others reach their greatest potential, together we can change the world. Peace. We out.